Hey there, I'm Tim Burnett, and this is the Solo Hunter Podcast. I'm all about hunting good, eating good, self-sufficiency, and downright rugged individualism. We're talking hunting and adventure, business and life with other self-sufficient and like-minded individuals. This is podcast episode number 11, Tracking Giants and Cutting Down the Learning Curve with Remy Warren. You kind of go out with the expectation you aren't going to see any deer. That sounds like most of my hunts. And the whole time I'm thinking, this is really stupid. Were you carrying your bow and your rifle while you are hunting? But I was carrying my bow for, I don't know, just to stress myself out. I was like, I am going to see the buck of a lifetime and be so pissed at myself. I don't even know what you're talking about. Something happened that I've never seen in my life and probably never will. He's servicing a lot yeah, of ladies, Yeah, and he had huh? no eyes left. He'd just been gored almost to death, and he's still just running around like nothing had touched him. I kind of lost my S. Wait, wait, wait. What do you mean you can't get high enough? <laughs> I don't really want to give everything away, but I kind of will because I don't really care. I'm confused. Like, nothing like that would ever happen to me because I'm like an amazing athlete. Yeah. Is all of a sudden, there's a big buck. Oh, gosh. And he's 30 yards away. You can't kill him from the truck. If you're out there walking around, I might be leaving with you Monday. Yeah, hey, hey, throw in an extra cop yeah, in the back of the truck. Exactly. I screw that. We'll pull the trailer up there. Oh, I need to drink sawdust. How is the audio levels? Can you hear me okay in Good. your headset? Uh, no, I can't. Also, my head's a little cut off in that thing. When I sit up. Don't sit up. Now what if I slouch? Now what if you slouch? <laughs> it's uh, it's artsy fartsy, man. It's designed. No, to it's cool. Keep it. Uh, do it's whatever you want. It's designed to not be just a, your typical. No, zoom it. You ready to rock this thing? Yeah, I'm so ready. We're, so we're here with Remy again in his doghouse man lair. Yes. And hunting season is pretty much over, almost. Well, yeah. for the year. Well, for yeah, till January. Where are you going in January? Coos deer hunting in Mexico. Really? Yeah. Nice. It's going to be a cool trip. I'm taking my buddies, uh, Joe, Mike, John, and Jason, my brother Jason. Nice. Now, Joe went with you last time you went down there, didn't he? Or was uh, no, not to Mexico. Time? This is the first time anyone else in that group has been to Mexico. Really? Yeah. Um, so, it'll be cool. We did one of those, uh, like, well... Yeah, I guess I can mention it. It doesn't really matter. Uh, <laughs> you don't except, have to. No, unless I like. <laughs> but uh, Jay Scott has like a, a bunch of ranches down there. So yeah. he did one of those like cool. kind of do-it-yourself hunts. Nice. Um, yeah, so it's cool. Like we get the whole ranch for the season and can go down there and pick the best week of the year. And Perfect. I just love coos deer hunting. And it's like that group of guys, we've gone to Arizona archery hunting and always said, man, wouldn't it be cool to hunt in Mexico? So. We're gonna I, give it a go. I was told the best week to go to Mexico was the same week that the shot show was, so that you didn't have to go to the shot show. Yeah, that's how I planned it. Yeah, yeah, that's smart. The shot show and the ATA back to back. Just yeah. go hunting instead. No, it's uh, well, that is the uh, it's because there's it's peak rut. The, well, the best this is a good year to go because it's peak rut, and there's no moon like right at the best time. Perfect. So I mean, if everything, then you, if you get a little weather, could be phenomenal. Yeah. Uh, Cool. Yeah. That'd be fun. So let's talk a little bit about, we'll talk about that one after you guys get back from that. Maybe we'll, it'd be fun to get Jason and Joe together. Yeah, that'd be cool. everybody in a big. Oh yeah. Those guys group. are so excited about it. Like, yeah, it's, bet. yeah. We've just been planning for a few years and it's going to be did cool. Did you say Mike is going to? Yep. Mike oh my gosh. and John. Yeah. yeah it's going to be a crazy. Yeah. It's going to be a crazy hunt. There's going to be some beverages consumed on that trip. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, fun. So I don't know what I might do. I might do something where I kind of go hunt with them for four or five days and then go spike out and do some solo stuff for four days, five days. Yeah. Whatever really you choose, sure. man. I mean, yeah. trips like cool. that are designed to be fun. Exactly. Really, so. so we'll cool. see. Well, uh, tell me a little bit about your season here. So when we last talked, you had just, we just talked about your um, Prince of Wales bear hunt. And then really it was just kind of all the in-state stuff that you were, you were heading out on. Yeah. What um, it's hard to remember because it feels so long ago. Um, it feels like a long time ago, but not very, you know, yeah, at the same time. I would say, so after the Prince of Wales, I don't even know what I did after that. I think I just had Montana stuff, Montana I, tags. I think you were just getting ready to take off to Montana. I think I had a lot of lofty goals of hunts that I wanted to do and then looked at the actual <laughs> calendar and was like, oh, man, now i got to be hunting. And uh, I think I 
I might have even I, I bought a tag in Idaho and didn't get to use it. Did you buy the deer tag? Yeah, <laughs> the season's still open, but yeah, I, I might know. go up next week. I think I'm leaving Monday. I might be leaving with you Monday. Yeah, hey, hey, hey. <laughs> throw in an extra cot yeah. in the back of the truck. Exactly. I screw that. We'll pull the trailer up there. No. Yeah, no, that'd be cool. Uh, yeah, so my Montana season actually, you know, it was a lot of guiding, and I didn't really have a lot of time to hunt for myself. Um, I actually didn't even think I was going to get to a chance to elk hunt because I really wanted to focus on mule deer this year. Mm. Um, and been a, it's just been a kind of a while since I got have gotten a good buck with my bow. And I thought, you know what? I didn't get a bow. I didn't get a bow hunt really much. And the days I did, I I spent chasing elk for the couple days that I had opportunity to hunt myself. So I thought, well, you know what? The, any day that I get to hunt during the rifle season, I'm just going to bow hunt for mule deer. Um, you know, obviously it's a general rifle season, but they're rutting. So you can sometimes slip in on bucks. That's kind of what you did like on. three years ago, four years ago. On yeah. That one episode. Exactly. Yeah. I kind of just said, all right, I'm going to bow hunt. But you know, the nice thing about bow hunting during the rifle season is if things go wrong, you have the option to go <laughs> rifle hunting. <laughs> and yeah, yeah this, the story of this deer hunt, I, it is a um, what a good friend of mine coins as a Pope and Gun Club, <laughs> <laughs> where it starts out with all intentions of being a bow hunt, but um, extenuating circumstances turned it into a rifle recovery. Yeah, yeah and it's uh, it's uh, something happened that I've never seen in my life, and probably never will. Well, we're Again. here to kind of talk about too. Yeah. Like, I don't even know what you're talking about. No, so, so you got to tell the story now. You've opened Okay, it. well, a few things happened. First off, I'm hunting in an area where it's really timbered and you don't actually see very many deer. So you kind of go out with the expectation you aren't going to see any deer. That sounds like most of my hunts. Yeah, so I didn't actually expect to find any deer, but I thought, well, and then I'm carrying my bow around. And the whole time I'm thinking, this is really stupid. Were you carrying your bow and your rifle? While no, you I was just carrying just my bow. bow. Yeah. Okay. And um, so, which I thought, I was like, I am going to see the buck of a lifetime and be so pissed at myself. But I was carrying my bow for, I don't know, just to stress myself out. And I spot a buck that is a heck of a deer for pretty much anywhere, but especially this area, you know, really wide, nice four point score. Well, I mean, almost 30 inches wide, probably 28 and a half, 29 inch, like a nice buck. But if you count the cheaters, no, this is a completely different. different Yeah. So, so I'm like, okay. And there's, there's, I just found this pocket of does and I kept checking. There was like, I, I saw one doe one day, then nothing. I think I went three days without seeing any deer. And then, spotted this buck and I don't really want to give everything away, but I kind of will because I don't really care. <laughs> uh, <laughs> no, I, did care. I was going to say, I think I yeah. saw an Instagram story that showed yeah. some stuff. So some yeah, of so you might've already seen. Exactly. So I, so the, the wide buck is just, I, I kind of came upon it, like walking a logging road, spotted him just below. He surprised me and he was, I don't think he really knew I was there. He might have heard something and thought I was. I think he did that thing where he thinks you're a doe because where I popped up, his head was behind a tree, and then I glanced out, saw he was good. So I'm like, get the camera out, get it ready, because I really wasn't ready for this uh, because I wasn't actually expecting to see anything. Um, And then... He's buying things, so I'm messing with the camera. So wait, were you seeing lots of de- lots of does too? No, or this I, is all just this one was all group? one. This was all at once. Hmm. Um, I'd seen all I'd seen up until this point was like five does, a couple in this general vicinity, one buck miles away that disappeared in the timber, and I spent an entire day going and looking for it. And I, it was probably just like a little basket rack, hmm. you know there. Um, and I just didn't. Yeah, so I didn't really see much. So this is all of a sudden, there's a big buck. Oh, gosh. And he's 30 yards away. So I get the camera all set up. And then, of course, he starts walking away behind the tree. If I was just hunting, I would have drawn back and shot this deer. No problem. Like, taking two steps to the left, shot the deer, been done. Messing with the camera. Get the camera set up. And then I had to move. So I move. And as I'm moving, his head's facing that one. He just whips his head back and looks at me. I get the camera right on him. And he just bolts like and I'm like crap that was my only chance so 
the next day I go back thinking maybe I will run into this same buck again. And I come around this corner and like not even, I'm probably a mile from where I wanted to be, where that buck was. But on the way out that night, I'd seen a doe in this one little spot. So I am at that spot where the one doe was. I come around, I look off to my right, and here is a giant buck standing there just sniffing a doe. Could you tell that it was a different buck? Oh, yeah. I mean, tall, cheater, nice deer. And I kind of lost my S. Yeah, my (laughs) stuff. I was like, it just was all of a sudden from kind of lazily just thinking, oh, I probably won't see anything ever again here, to looking up, and now the second day in a row, now seeing a buck even bigger than the day before, literally 20-something yards away or 30, I don't know, very close. So I get the camera set up. I'm, like, behind this rock. I get the camera set up. I zoom in. I mean, it looks like I am going to reach out and touch this buck. And it's super steep uphill, and I'm behind this rock, but I figure, well, I'll draw behind the rock and then step out and shoot him while I draw back so he can't see me. He, and then he, as I think he heard the bow draw back and he starts to turn around, but then he feeds again and then goes like, so he was perfectly broadside, perfect shot. And now he turns the opposite direction and is kind of facing me out of frame. So I, try to put the pin on him and the angle I'm willing that pin to get high and it just cannot get high enough. Really? I just wait, like, wait, wait, what do you mean you can't get high enough? Like right. I draw back, I put the pin, you know, trying to put the pin on his vitals, but gravity's just forcing the bow down. You know, I can't get like I'm confused. Okay, the because angle it's so steep. So steep. Shooting up. You're uphill, shooting uphill. Uphill, but I just can't because like, you're kind of falling backwards or something? Or? Yeah, I guess that's... Like, nothing like that would ever happen to me because I'm, like, an amazing athlete. Yeah. So I'm trying to figure this out <laughs> for you. Of like, why? Okay, Have you ever, like, been on an animal and tried to get your pin where it's supposed to be and everything you try, the pin goes anywhere but there? Oh, that's all the time. Yeah. So sometimes so, it's just like... So, I mean, what I should have done in hindsight is dropped to one knee, mm. giving me a little bit more leverage, like a better natural angle. Well, while this is going on, I'm, you know, struggling to get the pin up. I had my finger tight on the trigger and the bow went off prematurely. Huh. Yes. And then <laughs> it it hit so far away from the deer that it didn't even know it was being shot at. You're kidding. <laughs> and he, 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 like, heard something, but he never – it was weird. I was pretty much I what I thought in plain sight, but the deer never really looked at me because he had so many does around. And all he did was just trot to the next doe, and that next doe was just already feeding off, so she feeds off into the, the trees. The does didn't even know you were there? They no. Didn't clue. And then I, so then I reset. I stalk back in, but he's moving and trying to get the camera set up, moving in the timber, and he stops. And then there's actually a doe between me and him, and he turns and looks. And he, In the video, you wouldn't see the other doe, so it looks like he's looking at me, but he's actually looking at this doe that's probably 15 yards off to my left behind a tree. And uh, I settle the pin in and shoot. And it's like, perfect shot. Mm-hmm. Bucks, runs off. I'm like, cool. Well, I mean, hit him in the Funny, lungs. Right? Like, yeah. yeah. Okay. So, and then um, I go and, and like, I give it time. Yeah. Adequate amount of time. But it's also Which about is to what? get dark. Which is, for those listening, what's adequate, adequate amount of time I figure for you? I gave it. 45 minutes to an hour for a knowing double that, for a lung shot knowing you did a good lung shot. or heart shot okay that that might even you be know? a little bit longer than some yeah. guys might give it i mean he should have been expired in 15 minutes sure. but you know i gave it a little bit of time i find the tracks in the blood trail it's a great blood trail um what time of day are we talking we're talking now i start the tracking because it's gonna be dark so i give it time i go to do some tracking um because i don't know if it if this buck's expired right within here and it snows that night yeah, or whatever, like it's that time of year where leaving it overnight might mean not finding it even though it's close because it's so steep of a mortally hit deer could run a half a mile. That kind of stuff happens. So why, yeah, there, it would be ridiculous to leave a deer that you know is expired yeah, overnight, yeah. you know, but I gave it a little bit extra time because 
it was a big buck. I didn't want to, I just didn't want to push it. So I follow the, the, the blood trail. It's going downhill. I'm like, perfect. It's heading back toward where I want it to go. And then I keep following it maybe 150 yards away from where it was. It had bedded and I had obviously jumped it up out of its bed. And, and along the way, I actually found my arrow. So the arrow didn't, it, it was quartering away. And somehow as it jumped, it like, I think it heard the bow go off and, and turned slightly, but not, not enough. I mean, if you watch the video in slow motion, it looks mm-hmm. perfect. I mean, I could show you a picture on my cell phone of just, if you were to pick a spot on a deer, that's where it'd be, you know? Um, so, but it, I think the quartering away, it might've been a little far forward. Um, <clears throat> And I've had the experience as well during the rut, shooting a buck with my bow perfectly. And that buck going back to rutting does and chasing does and not even know he's hit because they're jacked up on adrenaline. Right. They're used to fighting. Mm-hmm. In this area, when you see a buck, I saw one deer in a neighboring area that had no, like... He's servicing a lot. Yeah, of ladies, and he had huh? no eyes left. He'd just been <laughs> gored almost oh, to death and he's still just running around like nothing had touched yeah. him so it's that kind of time of year so i thought maybe something like that was going on but i bumped it and then i followed it a little bit further just to think well maybe it bedded and then ran because there's no telling within that hour when when it bedded so i followed it a little bit further and then it was like bedded again within 100 yards and bumped again so i said well i'm gonna back out sure so so I leave the tracks, horrible night of sleep, hoping that when I return, everything will be fine. And it should just be in there somewhere. So, oh, but one of the one of the things that made me a little disconcerned was the track started going uphill from that second jump. So I knew that I had bumped it. Was he still bleeding pretty yeah, good? Yeah, he was, was at, the, at that point. Still bleeding. Yeah, but there's snow on the ground, mm-hmm. so it's really easy to follow. Yeah, a small um, amount of blood and yeah, snow looks like a lot. Exactly. It? But there was a, a substantial amount. But you could tell when he had bedded that second time, it was like something was a little bit different. Sure. So I go back the next day, start following it. And it had done this thing where it just kept climbing the mountain and bedding and then climbing and bedding. So I don't know if, I don't know what was going on, like getting spooked. Maybe he wanted, but all the does went up over this mountain. He was still just So I think he was just probably. following scent from the does, yeah. bedding, and any time he could get up, he would go and then rebed. Um, and there's snow on the ground. There's snow on the that. ground. Now, at this point, between the beds, there's no longer really much blood, mm-hmm. but there's blood in the beds on his left side. I might have to back up because I did find the arrow. And so what I had assumed was the arrow went all the way to the fletching. It looked like, and it had broken off at the broadhead. Mm-hmm. Or like just, you know, so I'm thinking it went through, stuck in the opposite shoulder or something, busted off and then came out. So I, I thought, okay, I got good penetration. It wasn't just a shoulder shot. It wasn't just, you know, it was a good, it was a good hit. I watched the video on my computer that night, slow motion zoomed in, it's like solid. So I keep following the tracks. Well, now the tracks get, got, he must have met back up with all those deer and at the top of the mountain, there's buck tracks going everywhere. Yeah. So I followed one set of buck tracks for a couple miles and found where it bedded again, and then there was no blood. So I thought, well, that's not him. So then I went back, got on another set of buck tracks, followed that set of buck tracks. not it, Just following every set of buck tracks I came across. And I ran into a few does and things, but no bucks. So then I'm like, well, I don't know. I'm going to go back. I'm thinking about going back to the truck, but it should be mentioned that on recovery day, I left my bow in the truck just in case. And you're packing rifle. Packing my rifle just in case something crazy happens. So I'm packing the rifle and I, I, I no real tracks went to this point to the left, but some did. And I didn't, it didn't really look like his track, but I thought, well, I have to investigate every possibility. And I'm fairly tired by this point because it's pretty deep snow. It's just a lot of hiking. Now I'm pretty far away from the truck um, because I started pretty far from the truck. So I follow this set and I go to this point where I think, well, and a deer jumps up in the timber and runs off. And I see it for like an eighth of a second. But it had this weird gait. 
And I said to myself, that's the buck. So I drop, I run down the mountain, I look, and I see this buck standing pretty much where that one would have run from. It's like this little three point. Hmm. I'm like, dang it. It must have not been. So I, I'm like, well, I'll work back the other direction, go check another set of tracks from the starting point. And it's fairly late in the afternoon at this point. So I go back and I cross the set of tracks where that three point would have run down. And I said, that three point actually bedded. And I look at the tracks and think those tracks are way bigger than that little three point would have made. Hmm. So I'm like, well, it's going to suck dropping down this super steep Canyon to investigate because I can see that deer bedded there. I thought, well, it's worth it. I just have to hike back up, whatever. I've already this far in. So I start dropping down the tracks go right toward that three point, And then all of a sudden veer off left. And I know at this point, I was like, that's my buck. So and those are the tracks like fresh from fresh. you bumping them so up. So I did bump okay. him up. So there was two bucks. So there, there was two. So what had happened was I think that the buck running had got the other deer to stand up out of his bed. And then he just realized nothing was going on sure. and bedded back down. Yeah. So now I'm like, okay. So now, but it ran into a, a burnt. Now the, the hillside where it run burnt off. So I'm just following tracks in the ground at this point. I follow him down, and then, long story short, I end up, you know, sticking on the track and finding the deer again, and just put him down with the rifle. Hmm. Um, but I didn't film any of this because it was just uh, sure. Yeah. So, a couple things. So, what was what was the buck's condition when you finally put him down? Like, how how was he? Do you think he would have kept going a couple more days? Like, what do you think? What well, do you think the deal was with that? Here's, I know what the deal was exactly. Because, because you I cut did, it with pieces, right? <laughs> well, yeah, because I was like this. When I walked up, I saw something that I'd never seen before. What had happened was, and I didn't even know this was possible, and maybe people will say, like, dispute. I took photos just so, because I figured people might actually dispute that this could actually happen. Somehow, don't know how, maybe when he turned, when I shot, it hit right where you'd want it had actually gone through it, it was a good shot but probably a more of like a one lung type shot so not the best shot but not the worst shot somehow that the wo- the entrance wound was between two ribs and in i don't know how it happened never will in its whatever maybe when the arrow came out something the lung had actually come outside the body and got closed off between the ribs. Interesting. So you're saying the hole was punched. Yes. So probably the hole was punched and then. I don't know how it happened. The I lung. I didn't even know that was possible. So the lung squished out the hole and then, and then was pinched off. Yes. Outside the rib cage. How does that happen? In order for that to work, it would have either had to bleed out or collapse the lungs or something, but somehow that act of that caught prevented that from happening. Maybe the broadhead hooked on it when the broadhead was coming out and pulled the air, pulled part of the lungs out the wound and then it kind of closed in when he bed down or something. Yeah. Cause you hear those stories of like people finding one, one, a buck or something shooting it later on one, one lung one. collapsed and the other one and it has survived. Hmm. I don't know, but the hole itself too was plugged. So it probably, that's weird. Isn't that weird? Here, I'll yeah. show you a picture. I don't, I mean, it's kind of graphic, but the whole story is kind of graphic. I mean, as a bow hunter, you strive to make every, everything happen, work out perfect. I did everything right. I, I wouldn't have changed where I aimed. I wouldn't have changed anything. I hit exactly where I was aiming. There's nothing I would have changed. I mean, hindsight, maybe I would have aimed a little further back, but in the moment, it, it, it looked good. Um, and to have something like that happen, it's just one of those freak deals where you just can't even, you really can't, no, you really can't account for that. Look at this. Have you ever seen anything like that? No. Or would you have picked a different spot to aim on that deer? No, no, because you no. were below him, right? Yeah. Shooting up. Yeah, no, that's perfect. I mean, if anything, you could hit him higher and been okay. Or a little bit lower. That looks to me like the arrow went in. Twisted. Twisted and caught a little bit. On, that's long yeah. tissue right there, right? Yeah. 
And then when the arrow came out, whether he grabbed it with his teeth or whether it just came out through the brush from the constant flapping. Because how far was the arrow from the deer, from the impact point when you found the arrow? Uh, quite a ways. So, so it happened right away, right before the first time it bedded. Yeah, so just him running and the pressure of the arrow coming out could have pulled that lung tissue yeah, out that something out that little hole. Pretty weird. Yeah. Never have I ever. Yeah, that's weird. I mean, in a mil- you, in a million years, that would never happen again. I've always I, I wouldn't think. I've always preferred, you know, it seems like the shots that you hit high lung, you know, it seems yeah. like those are the most lethal than a low hard shot right. or somewhere like that. That's the only thing I, because if you can take out their wind, you know, they don't run as far as if you just take out their, their heart yeah, a little I, bit, but you can, I, I always kind of go for just center, center mass yeah, yeah. in the vitals. Yep. I mean, it's, it's the most, if it goes up or down or yeah. left or right a little bit, you kind of got a little bit of cushion there, but I mean, and that's I don't know. weird. That's right behind the armpit and everything. Yeah. It's there. exactly that's where you, it's exactly where was there, told, was there an exit at all? Did no, it, there wasn't. it didn't come no. out any, so it probably did hit that shoulder. Yeah, I, I got the, back in. yeah, I got, well, the, the arrow was on the, or the broadhead was on the inside. Of the, the opposite chest side. cavity, yeah. was it? Yeah. Huh. It's yeah, weird. that's, I mean, those bucks, I mean, they're a tough animal. They, yeah, and I, that time of year, too, I think the adrenaline and whatever. So it was a tough animal. It was a humbling experience. I mean, it just, you know, it just, I hate to, for that to happen. That's the last thing I ever want to happen. But in those situations where it does happen, you just have to be diligent and and take the time to track it and spend i mean i i went a lot of miles that day hard miles thinking oh i'm never gonna find it i should go back but i followed every set of buck tracks i could and ended up paying off well that's the other second thing that i was gonna get to is um had you had experience with that before having to track track out like there was the group of the animals and you had to track out the buck tracks had you had to do that before yeah I or mean, was that something that you just kind of thought of at that time no i've done that before on different kinds of hunts um uh, some hunts actually just tracking live animals uh like buffalo hunting in australia i would cut a set of bull tracks and then you get mixed in with other tracks in the in the kind of like jungle type stuff and you go follow this track and then you finally figure out well oh, here's a set of calf tracks too okay i'll go back and then go back out and follow bull tracks. Um, but I've done that on other 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 times where even too where if you're blood trailing something that you know is expired or with clients, when I'm guiding, I get a lot of a practice tracking. <laughs> <laughs> no, I hate to say that. But I mean you do you do actually get a lot of really good experience tracking. Um there's very, very few animals that I haven't found. And the ones that I haven't found, I could probably say with 90% certainty lived for. Survived, Yeah, right? survived, yeah, yeah. Um, now, sometimes it might take a day or whatever of really getting down and tracking. And I've got a couple little tricks that I do for tracking dry ground. Um, one of them, measuring. Like, I'll find the track, and I'll take a stick. So where the track's clear, generally where it first ran, because you know exactly where the track is, so you can go there. And then you take a stick, and you measure out the stride length. And then you take that from where it... Now, when it's running, it's a little bit different than when it slows down again. But I break the stick off at the distance between the two tracks. And then I set that stick, and then I... you So you use that as a barometer. So it'll be like almost like using like a compass and math where it's you set the angle and Mm -hmm. you've got so you know that within this radius is where the next track will be and a lot of times when the ground's disturbed like in dry ground it leaves a depression but you can see that depression when you lay down and get the sun between you and the depression but there's a lot of ground to cover between that so you use the stick to gauge where the track might be and then use the light and the low angle to find out where that like because it's not going to be closer is. it could right. be farther depending on its strategy yeah but it gives closer. you it gives you a barometer yeah. of saying okay and not following the wrong the wrong thing mm-hmm. um sometimes that works too just based on like getting into other other deer and, and kind of even just m- using sticks to measure the track 
and, and the distinguish between two tracks. That's when it's just really like you might have to spend an hour to go 10 feet and then all of a sudden it's in an area where you can track again, but following it for that little right. bit, knowing which track to follow. Um, yeah, tracking there's a lot gets of tough. It is. And there's, there's some people that in this world that their tracking skills are unbelievable. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I once saw like a, 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 an actual Bushman do some tracking uh, when I was visiting a friend in Africa and they, the way that they track is like uncanny. I, you just don't even understand how they do it. When they do it, like they're not in a rush. There's their time is not an issue or do they have techniques that help speed that up? Both. They have, um, that's kind of where I picked up the stick technique, but they, they have a little bit of, a little bit of both, but they're, they're almost like, They've done it so many times for so long that they can just just, just look do it. and see yeah. what's different. Yeah. Hmm. yeah, I don't know. I don't know how they do it, but there's there's some people <laughs> with some skills out there. <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah, I should mention that the pack out really sucked. Why do I do this to myself? Well, I wondered because on the Instagram uh, story, it looked like it was a pretty long pack out. Like it, was, it didn't look oh, like no, just it was a not couple just miles a, down to the truck. It was through dead. It was through that eyeball high deadfall covered in snow where it's extremely dangerous. And I, where I was at, I said, I'm not coming back here. So I'm taking it all out in one trip, which I'm glad I did, but also was really tough and it's very dangerous. And then I got cliffed out. So I had to find a new route down. What cliffed out means for somebody who doesn't know is you choose a route and it ends in a cliff. Wait, (laughs) what he means is for those of us who don't hunt that rough of country. There's a cliff between where you need to be and where you are. And a cliff that you cannot get down. (laughs) Like 300 foot type cliff. Uh, Yeah, so that sucked. And then it got dark. And when it got dark, it was really, really crappy. And then I went to the bottom of this canyon knowing that I could get out to the mainstream. And then walk a long ways back to the truck. Uh, And what I actually did was I had my Delorme messenger thing. Because I was like, this is, I'm soaking wet. It's getting freezing cold. I was like, and now once, I knew that once I got down this stream to the other stream, I was going to drop my pack and then walk like six or seven miles back to my truck. But I, DeLorme messaged my brother. It's like, pick me up below, at the stream below this, because there was a road down there, uh, in about two hours. Four hours later, I made it. <laughs> <laughs> was he sitting there? Uh, he had gone like he, he couldn't because yeah. it was like, there wasn't very good satellite service or something. It's so. Jason. You can yeah, say he, he, was he was confused. No, no, he was in the right spot, but <laughs> my messages were probably a little confusing. Uh, but he was there. Yeah, it was great. That was the best sight I'd seen in a long time. It was cause it was about, yeah, it was pretty late by the time we got So there. did you, uh, did you send Jason back in after that other big buck that you saw or were you kind of holding that? No, he didn't, um. Uh, he was he had he was guiding after yeah. that. that that was it that was the end of our hunt so we didn't sure, have any more sure, chance yeah. to go. now you now you know where you're gonna go next year right <laughs> yeah <laughs> i would hush well we'll be sure and keep any any uh topography or any exactly anything out of that episode for sure so. i think all the shots are from just random places anyways you so. know what we'll do we'll just use footage from years before and throw it all in there and no, then just show no. the kill shot yeah, and then be exactly. done right <laughs> be perfect that sounds cool that sounds like a good hunt yeah. so um well, when I drove in, there was that elk on the, the wood pile. Oh, yeah. That's a very quick story. Um, I had no more time to hunt and went out and saw an elk Killed and shot it. an elk for me <laughs> and didn't film it. I didn't even think about filming oh, it. Oh, how liberating. Yeah. It must have felt. <laughs> I was right? like, I, I need an elk. Yeah. And so I shot that that bull. Cool. And I was pretty happy about it. Yeah. Nice. Cool. And that's it. In addition to that hunt, that I did for myself. The only, the other films hunt that we did this, uh, this fall, I wanted to do, um, cause I've been doing a few of those Ridge Reaper mm-hmm. hunts, uh, that they, they make little shorts out of a couple minute deal. Um, I was like, yeah, I think it'd be cool to do one about the guiding because most of my hunting is actually me taking someone else hunting. Right. I do get to hunt a lot, but a lot of my hunting is actually me taking someone else out. I mean, that's a big portion of my life, and yet you don't really see it in any way because I haven't really done any anything on it for like that's filmed, really. Mm-hmm. Um, I mean, I took Ranella uh, last year in where I 
guide, but I wasn't actually guiding. I was I was the one hunting, so <laughs> <laughs> that's completely different. Um, is after the seat or after I had after my clients had left, but uh, yeah, I, I thought you know what would be cool is why don't we do uh, uh, some kind of film or something where it shows me guiding um, and just a little bit of the, about that part of my life. So they agreed to it, and because I didn't want to. Um, I wanted, well, a lot, almost every year I try to guide one person that's probably never elk hunted or whatever. So that's always fun for me. And because we were filming it, I didn't want a client that, I didn't want to put that kind of pressure on someone. Mm -hmm. So I had, uh, Jed come out, uh, from Maryland and do his first elk hunt. And as, as me guiding him for this, for that week. And, uh, it was cool. It, It was a cool experience for him and a cool experience for me. And it was cool that it worked out on film. He ended up getting a bull. We worked very hard for that bull. Um, I think a lot of people and, and, and Jed's, you know, he's in the hunting. I would, I don't know if you call it an industry or whatever, but he works, he works for Under Armour, uh, which is fine to mention, but, um, <laughs> I don't know As if there was a caveat that yeah. we couldn't mention that. Right? No, um, he works for Under Armour. So he's around, hunting people that lot, elk hunt right. and whatever but i think has that he ever elk hunted before? he's never he elk never hunted before hunted. and that was part of the reason that i really wanted him to come out was because i thought okay it's a cool it'll be a cool opportunity for him a guy that works real hard and, and pretty much has a more of an office type job but loves to hunt and uh he's never been on an elk hunt and i figure there's no one better <laughs> in my opinion <laughs> than to break someone in on a public land elk hunt than me. Yeah, take them to Montana. Yeah, because sure. I don't I don't take it easy, I guess. I mean, even on if I'm day hunting, I my success is just based on just really putting my head down and just hunting harder than anybody else out there. You see people, but there's a point where you pass where people want to go. Mm-hmm. And that's where we get into elk. Um it's not really secret spots, it's just the secret is the secret ingredient is just working hard and then just convincing the people that are following you to work hard too. Mm -hmm. And that's really the recipe for success. A lot of times now this year was extremely different for elk because we had a lot of weather and it actually pushed the elk closer to roads. So people that didn't want to work hard or not, I don't like saying it like that. Like every elk hunt is hard, whether you're near road or not, no matter what your physical ability is, I feel like you have the potential to be successful. You've got way more potential than sometimes your mind yes. will let you. And sometimes you're just content right. with just being like, no, I'm going to road hunt today. Yeah. Or I don't want to go far and deep. And oh, maybe I'll do that next year. You but know, And so. here's, the, here's the thing, I guess I should say it like this, because – Every way that everyone elk hunts, no matter what your physical ability, is a tough hunt. Right. Like if you can't, if you physically cannot walk very far, then you're going to take roads, you're going to glass, you're going to try to find, you know, little short little walks, and you're going to be working as hard as you can, and you very likely could be successful. Right. My friend Mike puts it v- the best. <laughs> you, I, you know what I was going to say? No. You, you can't kill him from the truck if you're out there walking around. <laughs> There's no truer statement. So the guys that can't really walk around, walk very far or get whatever, they do the hunt that fits them, and they'll probably be successful because that's mm-hmm. how they hunt. Mm-hmm. And you, the people that hike really hard all the time, are like, I never kill, I always say, like, I never kill an elk by the road. Because I'm never by the road. <laughs> so I put it upon myself. But I think that it's just if you have the ability and you can try to get away from people, it's just a great elk hunting experience. There's fewer people hunting farther, farther away. back in yeah. than there are hunting So close, it's not so. that the, there's more elk there. Because this year there was definitely more elk lower by the roads because really? they got pushed down more with snow. the snow. Mm-hmm. And there was a lot of elk available in easy, what I consider easy areas, mm-hmm. which are still fairly tough areas. But – a lot of elk this year. Where you're hunting, is there is there a lot of difficulty with private land versus public? Um, or is yeah, it the pretty bottom, well wide open? No, nah, the bottoms are, are fairly private. So you, you can kind of hunt the edges. Do and the elk push into the private quite a yeah, bit? Yeah, they do. But mm-hmm. um, 
some of the some of the places were getting hunted by the landowners and the elk sure. were moving here, there, and wherever. And there was just enough elk that they were kind of getting run all over. Um, I don't know where I was going. This was confusing. <laughs> <laughs> you were talking about Jed's hunt. Oh yeah. yeah. So we hunted really hard. I don't think. I don't know if. I don't want to put words in Jed's mouth, but he was like, Do it. this is the real shit, man. <laughs> <laughs> I just, I saw his post and I was like, oh, he must have had a hell of a time. You know? Yeah, it was, it was, we had a lot of fun. And I wasn't, and honest to God, I wasn't like, oh, I'm going to really hike you hard. We did exactly what I did the week before with guys that are older and, it's just, it's just, well, Jed's a stud. Yeah. I mean, oh he's yeah. An no, he did. It's like, yeah. No, Jed did great. It was, yeah. but I think I just, we just put into perspective how hard public land elk hunting can be. Mm-hmm. It's not easy. It's never no. easy. No. Even the easy ones are hard. That's what I'm getting at. I think that's why I said that all that other crap. Right. Um, well, but how better? Because I remember when we were talking to those guys before with, when it was him and Scott and all that, and they were talking about some of the hunts that they were going to do. And, uh, Jed even said then, clear back at Total Archery or whatever, that th- that was the hunt that he was looking forward to the most in years was to go hunting with you yeah, because it was going to be public land, do it yourself, you know. Well, you're a guide, obviously, but, like, two buddies hunting. You know, it wasn't going to be just going to a, a ranch where 300 giant bulls are cruising around and it's and it's easier hunting. It was going to be a legit butt kicker. You yeah, know? Oh, yeah, and it was. And, and he even said, he said, this is the first animal I've killed on public land in my life. Really? Yeah, because if you think is about it, it, I mean, everywhere back east or sure. whatever is pretty locked up. A lot of whitetail hunting is private land. Yep. And so he's like, now I can actually wear that public land owner <laughs> t-shirt with pride and the BHA shirt. I was like, yeah. You know, I mean, now you know what, when I, now you know what elk hunting is through my eyes. What mo- the majority of people who elk hunt do not have access to private ranches right. or whatever. Now, Okay, some people might be like, well, he was going with a guide. Yes, but even with a guide, it's just that's the local knowledge. I I see – I mean, I see nothing wrong with hunting public land. I see nothing wrong with hunting with a guide. But I definitely think that there's an added challenge to even with a guide going and hunting public land. Well, I I had this conversation, I think, with Brian the other day where it was um, what's the difference of – someone going with you hunting or someone going with say Mike in his, one of his areas that has lifelong experience with that area or someone coming with me hunting elk where I grew up, you know, it's probably better than any guide would be. And so there's really no difference in that. You're just going with someone that has in-depth knowledge of that area. Exactly. And Um, that's, and that's what it amounts to is the, in, in what I hear from people that I guide mostly is Wow, I would have never have thought to do that. It would have taken a lifetime of experience to think to do that or look there or whatever. And so it just helps with the learning curve of this is how you elk hunt. Yeah. You know, I mean, I've elk hunted every day, pretty much every day of the season since since I was 12, 18. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and, and even before that, probably half of the season yeah. since I was 12. You know, so that's a, I mean, I, I literally have a lifetime of elk hunting experience and I've been on hundreds of successful public land elk hunts. Mm. And I don't think that very many people would get that opportunity unless through guiding to have that kind of experience. If everybody could have that kind of mentorship early on starting out, you know, to go with someone that successful and that experienced, there'd be. I mean, I wish I would have had that when I was a kid instead of going with my uncle that had never killed an elk. Yeah. He he knew how to chase them, but he had never killed one. And that's the thing is, you know, a lot of people that go elk hunting learn from somebody that doesn't, also doesn't know. Mm -hmm. So it's nice to have, to be able to go, okay, yeah, I can, you know, and have like, that's my, that's my job, (laughs) you know, taking people elk hunting. But because I can't guide everyone on the planet, that's the only reason I write for, say, Western Hunter magazine. Mm-hmm. Because I feel like it. I have had a great opportunity to learn so much about hunting. I mean, I have been in the field thousands of days chasing elk, chasing other animals. Like that, you know, there's very, I mean, I don't, I'm not like the type of legs like, oh, beat my chest. But I mean, there's, there's honestly very few people except for possibly other guy, you know, other guides that have that kind of experience. So for me, I feel like it's nice to share that experience and maybe cut the learning curve 
down for someone that only gets a few days a year to go out. If I can give them one tip here and there and they actually take those tips into consideration, then you know it's, it's nice to be able to share that with people and kind of cut the learning curve for someone. So in lieu of not being able to guide everyone on the planet or very, being able to only guide very few people each year, um, they, uh, you know, those articles, I honestly think that when I, when I write something, I put in, you know, all, from, it's from experience of thousands of days in the Elk Mountains. You can tell when you're reading your article, and there's others too, you can tell when you're reading an article that somebody put in a lot of time and a lot of thought, a lot of effort into, you know, more so, I mean, you can tell those ones when there was just, yeah, they were just thrown together and it's re regurgitated information and this and that. So when, when I read some of your articles, you can tell there's a lot of effort put into yeah, most, of them. I most actually, of them. I actually hate writing. <laughs> <laughs> I, uh, I, every time I have to write an article, it's painstaking. And maybe part of it is because I have so much I want to say, but it's so hard to say it in a way that makes sense. I don't know. I, I, I actually struggle with it every well, single time. Um, it's easier than than not being able to understand, to not be able to read it in a f- way that makes any sense. Yeah. You know? <laughs> exactly. <laughs> but, no, I will, um, before we sign off, I will say, I, I get a lot of um, people asking, like, if I would guide them. Um, and just honestly, I, I mean, we don't have room to guide everyone that, that asks uh, or, or wants to, you're, but you're pretty well, yeah, we, you got a steady client. Yeah, we've got versus. steady clientele. And, and, you know, I do that because I, f- I felt like starting out, you know, if you could get someone to come back for the following year, you know, the best client you have is the one you already have. You have to, right. you know, it doesn't cost you anything. Like they are already a client. You've put in your advertising and you're having to go out and get and whatever. And at this point we have a, a strong enough clientele base that we, rarely take new clients but we do have if just email hunt at montana com with the subject line waiting list <laughs> and you will be put on a waiting list take me any hunting. other no it just has to be that subject line waiting list okay. contact info what hunt you like because outside of that we just don't have time to to field through them but you know there might be a chance in the future and it's and and to be honest like you know, I can only guide one person a week or whatever, but we do have other really good guides. Well, because, so. too, the areas where you guide mostly, I mean, the deer's a little bit different, but most yeah. of the areas you guide for elk, those guy, clients are able to get a tag every, every year. year. Yeah, and they're deer a lot of times. Mostly we're hunting year, in general so. er, uh, general elk area. Right. Yeah. So that's different than somebody, you know, that's on, hunting in B.C. or whatever where the clientele may not have the ability to come back year after yeah, year. And so they're exactly. a lot more able to take, take new clients all the time. Yeah, but... Yeah, I think that it's cool stuff to talk about. Um, yeah, I guess, I, you know, I haven't really talked about the guiding much on well, Solo or whatever. I think if you watch through Solo, I think you'd understand that I'm a guy because I'm always like, mm-hmm. well, I got two days off to hunt for myself. I think yeah. people are like, he's always out hunting. He's, he's like, yeah, but I'm not the one, one shooting. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> it's like half the episode is like, he has a full beard. Now he has no beard. Now he has a full <laughs> beard. And then no. we have to, Tim has to rearrange it so it's my like, facial hair is. Because no people snow. don't, un- yeah, there's snow, no snow. It's because... Most of my hunting is on, just like everyone else, on the weekends. It just looks like you just hunt for one day and that's it. Yeah. Like you're just that good that you go out yeah. for one day and you're done. Well, I while I'm guiding, I'm also scouting for myself. <laughs> right? <laughs> I know where this stuff's at after, yeah. I, I mean, most, almost all the elk or animals that I end up taking home at the end of the season is something that a client's missed. Yeah, you could go back and look at most of our episodes and I'll bet there's a huge percentage of percentage of them that if they're not on the last day of the season, they're really close. To oh the yeah. Last days, you know. Yeah, it's the last two days of the season and it's generally something that now I had a bull this year that someone missed and someone missed an opportunity at. And then I was gonna go in for myself. It was a very nice bull. But I didn't have time, so I shot the first available bull I could <laughs> oh, find, geez. which was a nice little bull. <laughs> and then I told my brother to go in for this bull, but then he wussed out and didn't want to have to pack it that far by himself. Oh, jeez. I said it. Now nah, I don't know what happened. But he did see it, but I don't, he, didn't, he didn't get on it. So. Yeah. Um, yeah, well, me and Jed saw it. But then another bull walked 
out before that one did. And I was like, yeah, that's good enough one. Get that yeah. one. So they filmed that for for, for the Ridge Reaper. Reaper. Cool. Yeah. I can't wait to see that. Yeah, one. Yeah, I think that'll be cool. Oh, the cool thing about that. Well, this might be that that will probably be out. They're going to try to turn those around in a couple of weeks. Oh, really? Yeah. Wow. So Is, uh, shoot, like Mark three to four weeks. Subset. Yeah. So I think that should be out pretty soon. I don't know. I, I, I don't. Re- yeah, it'll be. Uh, be- It'll be what it, when is. it is. Yeah. Your last one, man. The last one. I watched it again last week. It's awesome. The moose just, one. Yeah. I, I like just, that one. I just liked it. Yeah. I thought it was cool. Yeah. Well, there's a lot of there's a lot of shots when the sub seven, the way they shot it and everything was a little different than you typically see. A lot yeah. of really macro shots, tight shots, and it just kind of helped bring in a lot of yeah emotion to the hunt. And then the what I really loved about it was the interview style of how they did it with Jason and with you. Yeah, I liked that. I liked Jason doing the uh, the interview part. I thought that was cool. Um, yeah, I thought, I, I thought it turned out good. Cool. This one will yeah. be good. All right, man. Well, I guess that's hits us at about an hour. That's about enough talking cool. about that. So Perfect. we'll move on to the next one. Huh? All right. Sounds good. Okay. <laughs> Thanks, Remy. Yep. Hey, big thanks to you guys for tuning in to this episode of the podcast. We really appreciate your continued support that you've shown to Remy and I over the years. Your support does not go unnoticed. For more information on the Solo Hunter TV show, branded merchandise, and other great hunting gear that we make, head over to solohunter.com. That's solo, H-N-T-R.com, where you can check out photos and videos from the Solo Nation. And if you feel like it, purchase the All Access Membership where you get unlimited access to our complete digital video library of episodes and web exclusive films. You also get an unlimited 20% discount on all purchases of Solo Hunter merchandise and automatic entry into amazing product and hunt giveaways. Again, we really appreciate you for being here and I look forward to meeting with and talking with you again soon.